few weeks. Now, I've just got back, though, from our annual pilgrimage to Europe with my deacons. So this year we had uh, 25 deacons. Uh, uh, these are transitional deacons. They'll be ordained priests this summer. And we went to Europe. We went to uh, London and to Rome. And then they went on for a retreat in Switzerland. Uh, it's just a wonderful experience every year to have uh, this kind of opportunity. But the one thing uh, that we have to do before we go is we have to spend a lot of time kind of training our senses and training our eyes uh, because obviously we're going to be looking at a lot of artworks uh, in the course of this kind of experience. And they don't know how to do it. They don't know how to look at art. They don't understand art. In many ways, I think uh, our young people today, they art is an elitist thing. It's for the people who are, I don't know, very elitist, wealthy, whatever it may be. But that's not the case, is it? I mean, we know, don't we? We know <laughs> that Christian art is really, uh, first of all, the main mode of catechesis uh, that we had in the church uh, for almost 1,500 years before we had kind of widespread literacy. But we also know that Christian art uh, tells a story that's deeper uh, than many of the other kinds of, of ways that we can experience uh, the world. Uh, right now, I'm teaching a course, which is fascinating, uh, if I must say so myself. Uh, <laughs> I find it fascinating. Uh, which is, uh, I, I'm doing the whole course of teaching uh, theology, themes of theology using uh, the literature and the short stories of Flannery O'Connor. And the way in which Flannery O'Connor's uh, kind of interaction uh, with the world uh, and her Catholic identity really do tell us a very deep theological story. So that's going very well. Uh, but the students are not, they're not really kind of ready to read short stories in literature. They are, they're still very much uh, about, aren't there just some facts that you can tell us and we're done? <laughs> Uh, so I, I, I hope that what I'm able to do this evening is not only kind of give us an overview, maybe uh, a little bit of an overview, uh, of what I call the physical exchange, that is to say, the way in which we receive images, uh, the way in which we receive ideas through images, uh, and uh, look at a little bit of the complexity of Christian art. Uh, and so using then art as a tool for evangelization, using art as, as a means of catechesis, using art for any other uh, I, So avoid Shakespeare. We're not, we're not interested in Shakespeare. But we have a few pictures from Shakespeare. Don't, don't pay any attention to the pictures. At this point, you'll come to the picture. So I, the question that really lies at the core of what I want to discuss this evening is what is the source of spirituality? How do we understand the sources of spirituality? And I think uh, for many of us who are, are very rooted, I think maybe in a, a formation programs, who have had some experience of uh, coming to adult education, who have listened to people like me drone on and on and on uh, for periods of time that you could have more profitably used for other things. Uh, I think what we've discovered is for us, <clears throat> Formation and education is really about learning facts, learning to read, learning uh, to know kind of information. And again, what I want to point out is this is not really the primary source of spirituality. Uh, I just finished writing a, 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 an article uh, for a book on uh, the sources of spiritual direction spiritual direction and process in the church where we uh, engage with a director to discuss various aspects of our spiritual journeys. Very good. And my, my, uh, my uh, contribution to this book is to look at alternative sources of spirituality. In other words, not books about prayer, not prayer books, not the writings of St. Francis de Sales, although these are very excellent things, but how does our spirituality, how does our Christian life, how does our identity as men and women of faith get informed by other aspects of our culture? And that's what I, I want to do, is I'm asking the question of, 
What are the sources of gaining spiritual insight? Is it only literature and reading? Or is it only literature and reading about spirituality? Or can we do other things? You know, what role does poetry play? What role does Shakespeare play? But don't pay any attention to him. So ministry or spirituality or whatever we want to think about as our service to the church, and all of us have it. I mean, all of us, uh, Just I, I've just come from a, a day-long accreditation meeting, so I'm a little punchy. Uh, but all of us are participating in the ministerial life of the church in one way or another. We are making a contribution uh, to the ministry, ministerial life of the church. And that ministerial life begins with reading. And by reading, I do not mean reading the written word. I mean reading what is around us, reading our cultural environment, reading the lives of other people, reading our own lives and understanding our own lives. And that becomes highly important. Uh, it becomes especially important when we are presented with certain kinds of images, such that we, in our ministerial roles within the church, uh, gain access to that, that process which uh, we refer to in the initiation uh, world as mysticogia, as a mystical experience, as gaining a, a kind of insight that goes beyond. And when we're talking about literature, or when we're talking about art, physical art, what we're talking about is gaining insight into faith, into the life of God, into our spirituality that goes beyond mere words. Have, have you ever had, I, I know you have, we've all had, but we have the experience occasionally where we gained an insight about something. For example, um, family life, something in, you know, in our work, whatever it may be. Sometimes we refer to this as intuition. But we know something. We have an insight. We know something. But we don't always know either what we know or how we know it. And I know that sounds, that sounds, very, that sounds very mystical. Yeah, it kind of is. But I, I want you to think about that. When I know something, but I don't know fully what I know or how I know it. I can look at a work of art and have an insight that is not reducible to just discussion and words. And this comes through beauty, it comes through symbolism, it comes through a variety of experiences. And so I want to spend some time talking about that. Theologically, let's, let's get the artistic world off, uh, at least to a theological beginning. Theologically, this is what we call the incarnational impulse. That is to say, the incarnation, as we know, uh, is the principle of our faith that guides and governs everything. Uh, the understanding uh, that the, the God that we worship in Jesus Christ is a God who took on flesh. And in taking on flesh, he takes on the sensual experience of the human person. We experience so much of our religion and so much of our faith through the senses, whether we're talking about communion and taste and sight and smell, or the experiences that we have in liturgy, but also the experiences of looking at images. So in other words, looking at images is to train our eye to gain the spiritual insight that the incarnation as a condition of our faith has already set up. Okay. And here, I think we're, we're, we're looking at two basic things, and that is one, in, in the Catholic understanding of what faith is, human artistry plays an important role. It is illuminating the real, illuminating the spiritual world. And if we're illuminating the spiritual real, we're doing that in a very focused way. Okay. Let me move uh, Finally, just let me, this is the theological part. You just have to suffer through it. 
my students do, so. <laughs> Art and, and the, the physical objects we're going to discuss this evening reside in what we theologians call the suspended middle ground. That place between what we know and what we intuit, uh, that space between the, the, uh, the physical and the spiritual, it, it resides in that, that middle ground, that suspended middle ground. And I think what, when I get into this discussion, I, I hope to make that a little bit more clear. So that's the theological part. We're done with that. We're now 45 minutes closer to cheese. <laughs> some time this evening looking at the place of art and, and particularly through several periods of art uh, and the way in which uh, the physical, uh, the pictorial arts, and I won't, I won't do sculpture and I won't do, I won't do sculpture. I'm not going to do it. Uh, and I, I, will, I won't do architecture. I'm just going to do paintings tonight. Okay. So I'm going to spend some time looking at paintings. And I want to do this uh, in three places. Uh, in history to show how the physical arts painting impacts, is impacted by the, the situation that it finds itself in, but also impacts the world uh, around it. And these are things, as I say, in talking to my dear seminarians, uh, that many of us have lost. We just don't know how to examine these things. It's so I want to begin uh, with an artist that lived in the 15th century, and the, the painter is, here he is, Jan van Eyck. Jan van Eyck, this painting, uh, this is a uh, self-portrait of van Eyck. Uh, van Eyck was uh, an innovative painter, uh, but he was not a painter by trade. He was a diplomat by trade, and he worked uh, in the courts of the Spanish kings. But he lived in what is today Belgium, uh, in the Low Countries. Uh, then, of course, they were Spanish uh, colonies, more or less, as we would know. But the Van Eyck was a very interesting painter, because here at the end of the 15th century, he is going to do something that is going to revolutionize the history of art in the Western world. And that is he invents a new technique for painting and that is painting with oil, it would be oil painting, right? Uh, and why is that such an innovative thing? Why is it such an interesting thing? And why does it become such a revolution in the 14th century, 15th century uh, in art? Well, the reason has to do uh, with two things. First of all, the kind of painting that existed uh, before this uh, determined fellow came into, a, uh, into the uh, was basically what was known as fresco painting. And it was really just the application of color onto wet plaster onto a wall. Think, uh, think about Michelangelo, the future generation. Uh, he painted directly into the wet plaster on the wall. This technique was, was very solid. It was very well uh, received, but it did not work in Van Eyck's world because the humidity was too great in Northern Europe uh, for fresco painting to be effective. You could not have effective fresco painting uh, north of the Alps. Who knew? <laughs> well, that I did because he invented something new. Now, the interesting thing about oil painting, as opposed to painting directly onto the wet plaster, is you can take your time with it. And he did take his time. Uh, it took about a month for a layer of paint to dry, which meant you could go over it again and again and again. And Van Eyck was an, an extremely detailed artist. So this can, this uh, panel, uh, one of the earlier Van Eyck uh, panels, is in the National Gallery of Art in London. And it's about this big, the actual size of the thing. It's about this big. And, uh, but just look forward, don't look at me. Uh, so the painting is like this big, but it is so detailed. Why? Because Van Eyck 
in many of, the, of his paintings, uses a brush with a single hair. That's detail. You, know, you go blind doing things like that. No offense, Bob. You know, but you, know, you can't. You can't do that. I mean, that's a lot. And especially since this wasn't even his day job, you know. Van Eyck was responsible then for creating this new way in which you could create this tremendous detail in the paintings. And this was very important. Uh, he and his brother, oh, let, me talk a little, let me do this a little background here. So the theological situation in Van Eyck's world was Van Eyck is living at the end of the Middle Ages. This is before the Renaissance. At the end of the Middle Ages, it's a completely Catholic world. And Van Eyck lives in a completely Catholic environment. And so he is going to be working in this very Catholic environment, and he's going to be painting for people who did not have an extremely high level of literacy. So in other words, the paintings have to be the catechesis. People aren't reading the books, but they are going to see these images. Let, let's look, for example, um, and, and again, this is also involved highly in a symbolic universe. So here um, we see one of Van Eyck's paintings. This is not the one I'm going to focus on. Uh, this painting is in the Louvre. Uh, there are only about 20 or so uh, extant panels of Van Eyck that he completed in his life that are today attributed to him. Uh, the most famous, of course, is the, is the famous Ghent altarpiece, uh, which is about 30 by 40 feet, a huge painting. But again, uh, it, the, the Ghent altarpiece, which is, 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 if you ever get a chance to go to Ghent, which I highly recommend, not only because of the art, but because they have terrific food. Um, it's all about the food with me. If you ever get to go to Ghent and can see the Ghent altarpiece, you'll be amazed to see a painting 30 by 40 feet that has over 6,000 figures in it. 6,000 separate people are painted into the Ghent altarpiece. And you're like, whoa, uh, and when you see it. But this is Van Eyck. This is his world. Now, look at this. It's a little brighter. This, uh, this is the, called the, uh, the Virgin of the Chancellor of uh, The fellow over here is the Chancellor. See, he's, he's kneeling down. Uh, you have on the one side St. Augustine. You have on the other side St. George. Uh, they are with the Virgin in the center. Uh, and this, uh, this is a very typical image. Now, notice a few things about this, because what it is going to do is, in that new technique of painting, which Van Eyck invented, essentially, uh, he is going to be able to do some really remarkable things. And one of the remarkable things, as I said, was to get this detail, right, with this single hair and brush. You can't really see it so much in this image, but when you look at that rug, in that rug, you can see every single weave. Now, the painting is about this big. In that rug, you can see every single weave, every single intertwining in that rug. Uh, look at uh, St. Augustine's row here on the side. And it is tremendously detailed, beautiful. Now, one of the reasons for this is you see this tremendous textile in the row, you see that, for example, uh, in the rug, you see it in the armor of St. George. Why such detail? Why such magnificent detail and beauty? Why? Because, guess what the people of Ghent and the Low Country sold? Cloth. This is an ad. This is showing people what they can buy if they just come to Ghent. I mean, it is an amazing way to intertwine uh, not only this kind of great artistic creativity and the symbolism, but it's also part of the economic fiber of the place that these artists are able to demonstrate kind of what they uh, are, are, are doing. And I want to spend some time talking about this painting, because this painting sets us up for what everything that, uh, that Van, Eyck is, Van Eyck is about. Uh, the painting is called the Arnolfini Wedding. Uh, it is uh, today, uh, it's a 16 by 20 panel, so it's about this big.
big. Uh, it is today in the National Gallery of Art in London. And it tells us everything basically we need to know about this late medieval period of art. Uh, the painting is a wedding portrait, many, many critics believe. Uh, of course, critics will always argue about things, but most critics say it is a wedding portrait of the fellow Giovanni Arnolfini, that's the, the man here on the left. Uh, he was a merchant uh, from Italy who lived uh, in the Low Countries in Rug. And he was uh, responsible for bringing uh, kind of the Italian banking system into Rug. He married this woman uh, who was also called Giovanna, so they didn't have a lot of creativity in names. Uh, but this is a portrait uh, that is demonstrating their wedding. Now, it's an interesting painting when we first look at it uh, because we see him, yeah, they're both quite young, as you can see, and he is holding her hand and they're making an oath right there. So they're having an oath making. He's holding up his right hand and grasping her right hand with his left hand. So it is the position of uh, the, the wedding ceremony, right? So it is, it, and it was probably intended to be sent uh, from their residence in the Low Countries back to Italy, but it doesn't seem to have made it, uh, and it has ended up now in London. So the art of painting wedding. So let's look though at what is in this painting aside from a very plain looking couple. They're not. They're not what is what do we want to see here? First of all, we want to see the clarity with which the light depicts the various things in the painting. So this is the chandelier. Uh, and you see, you go back to the original, you see the chandelier hanging in between. But it's not just a chandelier with a bravado treatment of gold, right? It's showing the gold. But what do we see in the chandelier? One what? One candle. There is the only candle. Now is that an odd kind of image for a chandelier only to have one burning candle? But why? Because it represents the marriage. It represents the wedding. Uh, it is the kind of nuptial it's representing a sacred space. And this kind of clarity of vision that you see that the eye has created is really quite remarkable. Uh, you see also the symbolism in the various places. So here, uh, in the back, the big one, this is uh, in the central uh, little, little seat in the back, right on the back wall. You see the, the uh, shoes, which are abandoned. Uh, you also see the abandoned shoes uh, in the front left side, out of the front left side of the hands. So you see here on the side. Why? They've both taken their shoes off because the ground upon which they stand is holy. Right? And so this image of the holiness of the lady is in that, showing the marriage. Uh, but the image of the marriage, the two, uh, holding their hands in, in, the, in, the, in the exchange of the vows. In the back, on that sofa, overlooking uh, the, uh, the two, uh, is a sculpture of a dog. But uh, you also see this. the dog is also in the bottom of the painting. So a live dog and a sculpted dog, both overlooking. Uh, the cleaning of one space 
asking for a sacrament and then the, uh, the renewal uh, of the space for uh, this new situation. The dog. Um, spousal fecundity and fidelity, ripening fruit on the windowsill, uh, all showing the of the viewer. This is the mirror that's in the back of the room. And you see it shows the back of them, but two witnesses who are, we can't see because it's us looking at them then reflected in that mirror. And th that also is a symbol of the witnesses necessary for the marriage. Right, so we're witnessing the marriage. I love that. And we're very nice to be around it. <laughs> and of course, uh, the spiritual program is essential here. So if you look at that mirror again, it is surrounded by the stations of the cross. And then, of course, we have um, prayer beads hanging on one side. In other words, all the symbolism, all the symbolism, which is, is just piled into this painting, was a, it was meant as a lesson not only to memorialize or to, to, to recognize the marriage of this couple, but also to teach the people who saw the painting something about marriage. That in the act of marriage, the ground upon which you stand is on the ground. You see also, for example, Calvinist ideal. 
and you have Flanders, that area where this painting is going on, stuck right in the middle. It is the, it is the battleground. As we know, for example, it would later be in every major battle that happens uh, right through World War II, right? So this area becomes a major battleground. But art, what is happening? Here I'm going to look at the, at, uh, the uh, artist Bruegel. Bruegel is another interesting artist uh, because he is a Catholic artist, but working now in an environment in which there's a great deal of tension uh, between the Protestants and the Catholics. And so what Bruegel does is he creates art that tells the Catholic story, but in veiled terms. In other words, not in terms of something as explicit as we would see, for example, in someone like the Ike a century earlier. So here is one of Bruegel's most famous paintings. Uh, it is in the Museum of, uh, oh, I can't do that, can I? No. Uh, <laughs> I have to stay right here. I cannot uh, It is in the Museum of uh, uh, the city of Brussels. It is uh, in the fine art gallery of Brussels. Uh, a painting is by Bruegel. Uh, Bruegel, again, a Catholic artist. So look at the painting for just a minute. And tell me what you see. What, what do you see? A farming community, or at least a small town, maybe, right? Or what else do you see? Where do you think this, where, where is this community, would you say? It's probably like where we're was painting, right, in the low country. Uh, what time period would you say it is? Winter. Oh, it's winter, definitely. It's, it's, it's a winter scene. Uh, and it is the people are dressed in the style of folks in Bruegel's own time. What do you think the name of the painting is? Anybody have an idea? Does anybody know? Catholic identity has come to the fore and is helping him 
uh, to see what's going on. His most famous painting, though, is probably this one called The Way of the Cross. And if you ever get the chance, which you never will, uh, there is a great film about this painting. It's about Bruegel painting this painting uh, called The Way of the Cross. Uh, the Way of the Cross, uh, again, uh, is in, in the art gallery of Vienna. Uh, the way of the cross uh, is showing something quite remarkable. So again, hundreds of images of people set in Bruegel's own time, right? And it's kind of a, a where's Waldo sort of thing. You know, where are the religious pieces in this painting? Now, of course, in the front, in the foreground here, we see a couple of things. First of all, we see Our Lady, right? We see Our Lady there, and she's with St. John and, and the two Marys. Uh, she's weeping as is her custom. Uh, and then you see also here the skull of the cow, right? Which, of course, is indicating the presence of Golga, of the place of the skull, right? But above that uh, is, uh, you see the, the tall uh, hole with the wheel. Now, we, does anyone know what it was? What? We, no, uh, I'll tell you about the windmill in a minute. I'm talking about this thing right here on the side with the seat with the wheel around at the top. What was it? Does it, anyone have any idea? It was an execution technique. You'd hang people on that until the birds peck them to death, basically. Very effective, uh, you know, as a deterrent. Which is why the bird is hanging out there. Uh, but in other words, it's invoking a kind of execution that was true in Bruegel's time, not in the biblical time. But the question that we have to ask ourselves is, where is Jesus in this scenario? And if you look, you have to look very carefully, but he is directly in the center of the painting. Do you see the cross? <laughs> and he's carrying the cross directly center of the painting. But it's, it's a hidden image, right? It's, it's a very close. So what is, the, is there? What is there in the painting? Well, we see here the execution wheel. We see in the background, this is where Golgotha, this is where they're heading, right? They're going to a cavalry. And two execution places are already in place for the two thieves. Uh, we see the other thieves being brought in in this cart. They really are kind of just regular folks from the time. We see Our Lady, interestingly enough, not dressed as contemporaries of the people around her, but dressed in, in front of these brutal violence, biblical garments. And then we see the place of Christ. Now here we're asking a very, very important theological question. In this painting, and in the world in which Bruegel lived, what is the place of Christ? And Bruegel, as a Catholic, has to say, well, the place of Christ, of course, is in the center of everything, but it's hidden. It's surrounded by all this noise around it, all these, these things that are going on. And we see this, uh, what we call the spirituality of alterity. So, you know, you have children, you have thieves, you have people doing everything that you can imagine in this scenario. We'll go back to the original picture. And they're fishing, uh, and they're skating, and they're doing everything that you can imagine. And isn't that the message that Bruegel is trying to send us? Is in our world, Christ goes daily to his death and yet no one pays attention to it. No one sees it as important. It is in the center, but we don't recognize that center. We don't understand that center. And this is, this is what art is able to do for us. It's able to tell us a, a very complicated story uh, in very interesting uh, detail. And here's the, the last piece uh, from Rubel, because remember you have 
of that image of the windmill, right, uh, at the very top of this hill, which is a completely crazy place to put a windmill, uh, makes no sense at all. But what is the what is the image in this windmill? What is the spiritual idea of this windmill? Well, of course, a windmill uh, has the cross form, right? But what is it doing? The windmill, the cross of the windmill, works by way of nature and the world. But it also, what does it do? What does a, what does a, a windmill do? What's it for? Power. It's power for what? What is, what is it trying to do? It's grinding wheat. It's grinding wheat. Aha! Eucharistic. In other words, at the very center of life, the, the cross, the windmill, is grinding the wheat. Christ, in his passion, is grinding the wheat that we will then experience in the Eucharist. You know, it brings all of these pieces together. But what's interesting is...
So for mere social and religious environment, uh, for mere, obviously, as I said, working in this context, uh, but look at the painting, uh, for example, Vermeer's painting of the vanity. Uh, this is a, a, an allegorical painting. Uh, she is uh, dressed very exuberantly. And it's interesting, Vermeer used the same sets, the same models, and the same outfits over and over and over in his, in his paintings. He just puts them in different poses. Uh, and this woman is seen in several of his paintings. But isn't it interesting? Here she is showing her domination as vanity, showing her domination of the world, right? But look at what she's surrounded by. That she's surrounded by images of Catholicism. So you see here, for example, uh, the crucifix. You see the chalice, which is sitting on the desk. You see uh, the open book of scripture. You see behind her a painting of the crucifixion. All of these images coming together, coming together. But this is one of the more exuberant of, of Vermeer's paintings. Vermeer's Catholicism was interesting because this, uh, this painting, uh, excuse me, this, uh, this uh, image comes from uh, the city of Amsterdam. Anybody ever been to Amsterdam? Uh, I know I've been to Amsterdam uh, very many times. Uh, Amsterdam is a fascinating city today because Calvinism has basically taken its toll in Amsterdam. It's the most secular, a very secular city. And, uh, you know, but Amsterdam is wonderful to visit. It's a canal city, right? You have these amazing art museums, the Van Gogh Museum, the Rijks Museum. You have the Anne Frank House in Amsterdam, all this fascinating stuff. Uh, but if you want to see something really interesting about Catholicism, uh, you have to go to the Red Light District. I do not recommend. <laughs> In fact, I have to. Uh, <laughs> uh, I was giving this little lecture and something about the red light district and the students were like, Brother Father, what's the red light district? I said, You jerk, you know exactly what the red light district is. <laughs> I just want to see Father embarrassed. Well, Father, can I be embarrassed? Uh, but in the middle of the red light district in Amsterdam is this. Uh, you go into a house that's like every other house, except it doesn't have prostitutes. Uh, you go into the house, you go up the steps, you go into the attic, and that's what you find. This is where the Catholics had to worship. In this attic room in this Amsterdam house, this was the church that was available to them uh, at that time. So no public, it was like England, no public places of worship for Catholics. They had, unlike England, the ability to develop these interior house chapels. So what you find, given that kind of a scenario, is an entirely coded uh, version of Catholicism in Vermeer's work. So, for example, uh, here we have uh, the astrologer. Uh, again, uh, every one of the paintings is going to show basically the same thing. Someone sitting at a table in front of a window looking at something. So the same image appears again and again. Behind the person is always a, a painting on the wall, some books, and always a tapestry. Every one of them with a coded image of Catholicism Brilliantly done, brilliantly done. But of course, Vermeer is painting his time symbolically, right? He's painting his time in which Catholicism was in the attic. Catholicism was secret. Catholicism was becoming quickly something that had to be undercover. Here we have probably one of Vermeer's most famous paintings. Uh, it is called Pearl Merchant. Uh, Vermeer paints this painting. Uh, and paints the woman in the painting uh, about eight times in the course of his career. He uses her basically in the same or very similar outfit every time. So what is going on in the painting? Well, first of all, you see she's at the table. She's standing in front of a window. And behind her is a painting. And what is she doing? She is measuring. She has a, a measuring. 
she is measuring the weight of pearls. Pearls are a very important image for her here. Remember, he, he did the pearl, girl with the pearl earring that came in the with Greece. So it's got your hands to She's weighing pearls. She is also holding in a balance the weight of something else. Now, the question, of course, for us is, who is this woman? And what is the imagery around her? Well, first of all, we have to start with the painting in the background, which is a painting of the Last Judgment. Uh, it, the image is the Last Judgment, so Christ is returning, and the judgment uh, is being made, and the, the souls are being weighed in the painting. <coughs> so St. Michael holds a scale, and this is a very popular image from the Middle Ages. St. Michael holds a scale, and uh, so the little soul gets in the, in the scale, and if it, if it goes high, then the soul goes down, and if it goes low, and what you have uh, frequently in the images from the Middle Ages, wonderful images you see of uh, sculpted. St. Michael holding the scale, the little soul is like in the scale, and then you have a little demon on one side holding it down. <laughs> must remain hidden. In other words, the pearl must remain in the little, uh, the little uh, mollusk or the little shell until it is finished. But it must remain hidden. And so when it comes out, it's a precious thing because it's been hidden for so long. And that's a very interesting image of Catholicism in Vermeer's world. So the woman is, is doing a measuring act just like St. Michael is doing in the background in the painting. She is, as you see, um, is pregnant, right? I hope she is. <laughs> she's, a, she's a nice, healthy Dutch girl. Okay? <laughs> and also wearing a blue tape. So, what the, the in, in Catholic art, the very presence of blue should be a symbol for us for what? Why, why does Mary wear blue? Or how did she come to, to wear blue? Does anybody know? Um, Pi is associated with our lady. Go. Lapis. 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 You know all about it. <laughs> Lapis lazuli, yes. The stone, which was crushed into uh, a pigment, was blue. It was the most expensive thing you could get. So that's what you could put on our lady, is the blue. You know? so, so our lady, you know, of course, was, she, she was a very snazzy dresser, even in Nazareth. <laughs> in other words, we have to see in this painting a great deal of very, very uh, kind of hidden imagery. And here's the message, I think, that Vermeer is trying to send us, and that is that the divinity is in the detail. The divinity is isn't that an interesting idea for us today? You know, we uh, can become so wrapped up in the practicalities of our faith. And I, I just spent an entire day with the accreditation team. <laughs> we're talking about practicalities. We lose sight of the fact that the divinity is in the detail. It is in our careful consideration of the things around us. <laughs> then what we see happening in art is, is a rather sudden uh, 18th and 19th century where I call the shift to the secular. Um, this is Delacroix's painting the raft of uh, the uh, the raft of the Medusa. Uh, the raft of the Medusa is an interesting painting. Uh, it's done kind of in the context, the near context of the revolution of Mary Curie in France. Delacroix was a great painter of the revolution, the revolution uh, after the French Revolution, you say, certainly in that early 19th century reality. 
This painting is very interesting. It's a huge painting. It's bigger than, than, than the screen here. It's going to be all these pages. It's brown, this brown semi-circular thing. Uh, and it, it shows them something that uh, was very interesting. And that is, it was a story from the newspaper from the day. Gavrikov's painting the shipwreck of the Medusa. And so these people are on uh, this raft, which they made, which was the only survivors they have from the ship. So it's like the Titanic in, in their day. That was the story. And, it should, and so it's like if somebody painted the Titanic 15 minutes afterward, this would be the same sort of scenario. But you see how this painting of a news item is a very different scenario from what the other artists that we've been looking at tonight are doing. This is a shift to what we call the secular world. And the secular world is a, it, it, it is only interested in the present. It's not interested in anything long term. It is not interested in anything symbolic. It's interested in showing you what happened. And the painting, when it was done, was not done for what we might call an artistic done to illustrate what had happened. And it was reproduced many times, and it was, it was done in the grave and put into the newspapers. But you see, it, it's an important moment in the history and the development of the story. They had shipwrecked. You see that many people have already died on the raft and are being thrown into the water here. But they have just now, the first time, decided you can't really even see it in the horizon. They're about to be saved. But they've suffered a lot of losses. There's, there's very little symbolic imagery in a painting like this. And what it does, it really creates a different world, a different environment. Of course, no one was not interested in religion at all. We did paint some religious painting, but we did so it so it's Just to conclude, I would like to Look at this final painting. This painting is in the uh, National Gallery of Washington. Uh, the, the rather than the music, it's in the uh, but this painting is in the National Gallery of Washington. And uh, it's called the Salt and Box. Uh, Salt and Box, uh, and it's by the uh, Pablo Picasso. Picasso's painting is of a group of traveling artists, uh, and in this case, theater artists, who perform in the Commedia del Arte style uh, that was very popular at that time. So each one's representing a different character in the Commedia del Arte. What do you think about this painting when you look at it? What, 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 what do you feel? What is it you think of the spirit of life? What do you think about looking at this character? that kind of set in the Spanish desert. Impressive. Yeah, he's a good blessing. I mean, they're supposed to be comedians for God's sake. Um, <laughs> and yet, it's not only is it impressive, but it shows the isolation of modern humanity. I'm sorry, who is this by? Picasso. Oh, that's a Picasso. Papa Picasso, Spanish man. Ah! Uh, and so what Picasso is doing is he is showing the alienation of modern humanity. And he's not interested in the symbolic world. He's not interested in showing any kind of death. He's just interested in showing a group of people sitting on the side of the road waiting for oblivion. And he, Picasso, is painting this as the condition of modernity. Of modernity, of our world today. And you see, this is a very different world from Manai, from Ruko, and from Vermeer. And this is what the artistic ideals of our own time have come to be. Half of art for the most part, is dead. It no longer exists. Uh, we are not particularly interested in artistic endeavors now.
And yet, the world of art wrote for us over a long period of time a story which stands at the center of our self identity today. <clears throat> if we do not understand it, it's very difficult, I think, for us to understand uh, the ideals of the capital. So this brings to a conclusion this little visit through the world of art. Um, any questions or any thoughts that you want to raise before we finish here? Yes. Something visual, 
something to look at in our parishes, we tend to go to catalogs. You know, and it's the same statue of St. Joseph that's found in every parish, or Arlington, or whatever it may be. Uh, which is not bad, but maybe it's, there's something else. How can you interpret something that's not uh, religiously based, if it's secularly based, if you try to make, make some sort of a religious interpretation of something that may not have been... Well, first of all, I, I would say, uh, get ready, everything is, is religiously based. It may be negative about religion, but it's saying something about religion. Uh, and that's where I... But there are works of religious art today and there are painters and, and sculptors that are creating it. It's just not as much here, I would say, in, in our country as we would see it in other places. Yeah? Uh, Father Terry designed the art in our day chapel. Did you see that? That's beautiful. Yeah. Recent. Yeah. And, and sometimes it's, you know, yeah. So we, we have spotting examples that we can find in different places. Yes.